So we're in part three of our Acts series, and this morning uh, we'll be looking at the powerful testimony of the church, the church in action. Um, Acts is very much a book about the work of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? And as we've been singing this morning about the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, um, we, we cannot get away from the fact that, yes, it's the Acts of the Apostles, it's the Acts of the Church, uh, it's the Acts of Jesus after He has ascended into heaven, and it is the Acts of the Holy Spirit as He works through uh, God's people. So please turn with me to chapter 5, and we'll be reading from verse 12 to verse 16. Acts 5, verse 12 to 16. The Bible says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, Believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits and they were all healed. So the background to our passage is that God's power had been demonstrated through a dramatic death. And Ananias and his wife Sapphira had died very dramatically. And the reason is that they had sold a piece of land and they had agreed amongst themselves to come to the apostles and present an amount from that sale as if it was the full amount. They had the opportunity to keep all the proceeds from the sale. They were not forced to bring anything. But they brought under false pretense that we've brought everything. And God strikes both of them dead. And great fear came upon the whole church great fear came upon all who heard about what had happened. And now God's power was being demonstrated again through signs and wonders, healings and deliverances from demonic affliction being done by the hands of the apostles. And they were meeting in this place called Solomon's Portico on the east side of the temple. So they were engaged, as it were, with the religious culture of the time, which the temple very much symbolized. And in fact, Acts chapter 3 tells us that Solomon's portico was the place where Peter had boldly proclaimed the gospel to the people after he and John had healed that lame beggar. And if we go back to the gospel of John, we see that Jesus was almost stoned there by the Jews for saying, I and the Father are one. So this was a, a place of action for a church in action. And this morning we have three M's to look at. M number one is many miracles. M number two is this mixed crowd that was gathered here in the temple. And then thirdly, we have these multitudes that were added to the church. Let's begin with the many miracles. Verse 12, now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. Signs and wonders. It's telling us that supernatural things were happening among the people. There were many miracles among the people. Many tells us it's an abundance. Of the supernatural. There was plenty of the supernatural, but it wasn't a binge like a once off. Gonna take it all in. No, it says that they were regularly done. So there's many miracles, but it's happening regularly. It's part of the church culture. 
that the miraculous is happening. Miracles were a part of the Christian life. And this is why E.H. Andrews, he says, the miraculous is absolutely basic to Christianity. Amen. And I wonder if that's your view of Christianity, that the miraculous is actually basic to Christianity. Amen. And it's done among the people. This is not the people of God, the church. This is not your own people. This is people in a general sense that there was a city, there was a group of people that are looking on. There is a general population and the miracles are happening in their midst. This is the church of Jesus Christ testifying to those who are not yet part of their community through a demonstration of God's power. By the hands of the apostles. These are the men that had been with Jesus. They had seen him perform many miracles. These are the guys that he had said, I, I give you authority to pray for the sick and cast out demons. These are the guys who had experienced failure along the way. Matthew 17, they couldn't heal a demon-possessed boy. And Jesus told them, it's because you have little faith. These were the leaders of the church. The miraculous happened when God worked through the hands of humans. He could heal and deliver without any human role, but he chose to work through human hands. Amen. And all of us can be used by God. Amen. Yes, there is a place for leaders to be at the forefront. It's the hands of the apostles. Leaders leading the way, leading the charge, and saying, God, we want more of your presence. We want to see your power. Use us, Lord Holy Spirit, to see people set free. Even Peter's shadow. And so they carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. This was amazing. God can heal and he can deliver in many ways. Lay one of hands, rebuking the prayer of faith, handkerchiefs and aprons as through Paul. And here, Peter's shadow, it's grace, it's the power of God, it's an atmosphere of faith and we, we don't get superstitious about it. We, we don't put God in a box. Can God really do that? God can do it. Yeah. He's done it and He still wants to do it. Right. He will work as He chooses. Now you might not believe in miracles. You might be a Christian here who says, you know what? Miracles are a thing of the past. That's my Christian worldview. My reading of the text is that miracles no longer happen. <coughs> You might be a Christian and you have experienced so much bad stuff with so-called miracle working preachers and pastors and you're like, man, everything to do with that is just false, it's fake, miracles do not happen. Or you might not believe because you are not yet a follower of Jesus. So you have no basis for faith in Christ to believe in the miraculous. Your view might be, well, I, I need a, a scientific explanation for everything I see. The supernatural occurrences, they're not actually possible. One challenge with that kind of thinking is that miracles cannot be confined to the laws of science. If they can be, then it's no longer a miracle. John Blanchard put it this way, he said, a miracle is by definition beyond the ability of science to explain and must therefore also be beyond the ability of science to disprove. God can work through science, however, God, the God of the Bible, is also above and outside of science. If God is limited by science, he's not really God. God who is all-powerful, who, who created it all, who created science. We say, no, we, we need to explain everything by something you created. Dave Hunt, he put it this way, miracles are only impossible if the universe is a closed system and all there is. It's not a closed system, there's a God who controls it all, who rules over all its affairs. Another challenge with not believing in miracles is the many people who will testify that they have seen miracles in their lives. How do we argue with that? How do we argue with someone who says, actually, 
I was healed. God did something in my life. And the evidence is there. I mean, they, they, they tried to do it even here. When, when the lame guy got healed by Peter and John, the religious leaders were confused as to how to deal with it. They were like, we, we actually, it's happened. This name of Jesus, so we're going to try and, and kind of hide it and put it aside, but it's actually happened. Last week, we had a lady in our Swahili service stand up, and she said, I want to give thanks to God that the week before I came and I had problems with my eyes, pain in my eyes, seeing is difficult, and, and we had an opportunity in that service to pray with her. And she stands up and she testifies and she says, God has healed me. My eyes are fine now. That's the truth. How do we argue with that? I look at my own life and times when God has healed me. A couple of years ago, I was, I was battling with the worst migraines ever. It was just terrible. And did the, the tests and the ECGs and all the kind of head scans that you do to check what's going on and medicine and none of it was working. And then I received prayer one Sunday morning during a church service. And things changed. How do you argue with the fact that people will tell you, listen, God has done it. God did something. We accept that God doesn't heal in every situation. Why? Because sometimes His plan is fulfilled better by Him not healing. You may have struggled with a health condition for years and you have wondered, why has God not healed me? I've been praying. Does He really heal? I'm with you. I mean, I have had a back problem for about 13, 14 years now that I've been praying for and praying for and praying for. And sometimes it just seems to get worse and worse. And Lord, if you're this God of the Bible of miracles, why are you not healing? He doesn't heal in every situation. Sometimes he decides, you know what? My grace is sufficient for you to stay like that. My purposes will be fulfilled better by you not being healed. Sometimes it's lack of faith. We see in scripture, the Bible says sometimes lack of faith actually does contribute. Jesus did a few miracles because of their lack of faith. Also, we live in a fallen world where the kingdom of God, which is coming, hasn't yet fully come. So everything of the kingdom that we will see in its fullness when Christ returns, it isn't all here yet. So the kingdom is breaking in. It's coming with power and glory, but hasn't yet fully come. We live with this tension of the of the, the now. Hey, but the not yet. But despite these realities, God does heal. God is a miracle working God. And the impact of what God was doing was spreading beyond Jerusalem. The people also gathered, we read in verse 16, from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. The news of God's power, the news of this dynamic church in Jerusalem spread to the surrounding towns. Wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be amazing if Dar es Salaam, which attracts people for commerce and business and trade. If Dar es Salaam could be a place where people come because man, the power of God is in that city. We've heard that people are getting healed in the city of peace. We've heard that there's miracles, that people are being set free from demonic oppression in that city. We want to go to Dar es Salaam because God is at work there. That is what was happening in Jerusalem because the power of God was at work. It's worth noting that there is a distinction that Dr. Luke makes between sickness and demonic activity. They brought the sick and those afflicted by unclean spirits, which tells us that not every sickness is caused by a demon. For some of us, our default position is anything happens there is a demon behind it. 
And yes, there could be demonic activity, but not everything that happens is because there's a demon behind it. We live in a broken, fallen world where bad stuff happens. And Luke is separating these two. John Stott tells us Luke does not confuse the two conditions. So what's the application for us, dear friends? Well, let's step out in faith into the city of Dar es Salaam and, and make our hands available as instruments for signs and wonders. Praise God for the many doctors and hospitals and, and institutions of health care in our city. Praise God for the doctors among us. It's awesome to see what God is doing in the city. But beyond the ability of medical professions, professionals, we need the power of God Amen. to break in over our city Amen. so that people would be healed, so that people would be restored to health. And can we make ourselves available and say, God, if you could use these folks from 2,000 years ago, Lord, you can use us now. Yeah. We want to be available. So that's the first M. We have many miracles. They are part of the culture of the church. It's in their DNA, so to speak. The second M is this mixed crowd that was gathered there. Verses 12 and 13. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dare join them. But the people held them in high esteem. So they're all together. Who is this all together? That's the believers and their leaders, the apostles. Who is this? The people, the rest. That's likely the, the general public that was observing what was going on in Jerusalem at the time. And some have actually suggested that the rest are different from the people because they dared not join the believers while the people held the believers in high esteem. So for instance, commenting on this, Albert Barnes, he says that the rest could be people with wealth. People like Ananias and Sapphira, afraid that God's judgment would fall on them as well because of their deceitfulness. Whatever the case, it suffices to say that there is a a mixed group that is observing what God is doing in this place. And God's power, if we look carefully, we realize that the power of God affected this group differently. For the Christ followers, it seemed to be a source of unity. Because it says they were all together in Solomon's portico. When the power of God comes upon God's people and He purifies and He and he brings his, 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 his holiness into that place. There's a, there's a way in which God's people are brought all together. So there's this impact on God's people that we become stronger as one. For the rest, for the people, it's a source of fear. Because it's a source of war. Because they dared not join them. It's a source of war because they held the church in high esteem. So there's a different effect that happens to these different people that are mixed here. When the church is in action through the power of the Holy Spirit, it will draw a mixed crowd. When God's people gather, it is not a closed club. There is an open door policy. Everyone is welcome. We are not an exclusive gathering that says, hey, we are the elite. This is just for us. The rest of you stay out. It is a mixed group where God's people are together, but right among God's people is those who have not yet believed, wondering what is going on. A church is a community that is meaningfully connected to the wider community. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus came for the sick, not the righteous. So people that are lost spiritually, people that are sick spiritually should be a part of our lives. They must be. So when we gather publicly like we've done this morning, our worship songs, our preaching, our praying, 
is mindful of this mixed audience. We are growing the Christian and we are also reaching the non-Christian. So our language needs to be accessible to both. So there's nothing wrong with saying lots of Christianese words and I'm not going to pick any right now. <laughs> I can think of some. But in a mixed crowd, you're asking yourself, how is that helping the non-Christian to be more part of this? How are we helping those who are not yet following Jesus to engage more in this? Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. This is what it says of Jesus. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Jesus had a mixed group in front of him. He saw the crowds. The crowds of Dar es Salaam. People on a spiritual journey exploring his claims. Is he really the son of God? Did he really rise from the dead? Did he really perform miracles? He saw the crowd. But in the crowd, his disciples come to him. And that's what church should be like. There's a crowd, but there are those who are already disciples of Jesus. And if we keep that in mind, then we will think about church and the way we do church as a way to grow. Yes, I want to grow, but man, it's also a way to reach out and be on mission and bless the city. I love the fact that our passage does not water down the truth. It doesn't say water down the gospel. It doesn't say dial back on the supernatural. When, when, when the mixed crowd comes, when all these people from different backgrounds come, be more cautious about the supernatural. Actually, our passage shows the opposite. Our, passion, our passage shows that a demonstration of God's power through signs and wonders actually gets people's attention and draws them in. What do we take from this? What's the application for us? Well, the application for us is that we should live our church life, be it Sunday morning, be it you know, life groups, as, as Offense announced this morning. We need to live church life by making room for a mixed crowd. And I would ask each of us to consider this question. Where are the crowds for us? Where, where, where is the crowd in your life? What crowd has God allowed you to be part of? Where is your sphere of influence of those who are not yet followers of Jesus? Because he came for them. And he wants to use you and use me to reach them. And then the third M is this multitudes. Verse 14, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. The impact of God purifying the church through the death of Ananias and Sapphira, the impact of the signs and wonders that were being performed in this group was that incredible numerical growth took place. And talking about numbers might be something that we get uncomfortable with. Why are we so concerned about numbers? Well, as I read the book of Acts, the book of Acts is also very concerned about numbers. Because every number is a soul. Every person matters to Jesus. Every number is either someone who is in the wrong kingdom or in God's kingdom. So it's not just the numbers game. It's about the very souls of the people of this world. And this verse, it, it sounds like a verse of comparison. Because we see that, that word more there. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. The word more seems to be comparing the, the significant increase that had already happened in the previous chapters. So if you recall... On the day of Pentecost, we, we, we saw this two weeks ago, 3,000 were added to the church. 
And at the end of Acts chapter 2, we are told that daily conversions and joining to the church was happening. In Acts chapter 4 verse 4, we are we we're told that many believed after Peter preached in that same place that they were in right now, and that the men came to about 5,000, leave alone the women. So it looks like Luke was building up the tally of those who are coming to faith in Christ. And it's multitudes here, it's multitudes. It's as though Luke is saying, what's happening now is even more than what had happened previously. More than ever. I'm not talking 5,000, 3,000, it's just multitudes now. It's lots of people. Massive number of people becoming Christians. And this is, this is a, it's a big thing for how we think of the mission of God. Because if we realize just how big the mission of God is, then as we look across our city, we realize that, man, there's multitudes in our city. There's hundreds upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people that do not know Jesus. And we realize that God actually wants his church to grow. So we should desire to be part of that growth of God's church and certainly not at the expense of, of the qualitative things that God does in his people. Discipleship and, and purity and depth in the word and, and commitment and community and, and all those good things that make up a Christ follower. And ultimately, who grows the church? It's God. We do our part, but ultimately it's up to him as to when and how he will do it. Numerical growth is a noble thing to pursue as we play our part in reaching the multitudes that cannot be counted, that we read about in Revelation 7 verse 9. There's multitudes that cannot be counted in heaven. And we get to be part of that while here on earth for the short time that God has given us. Reflecting on Isaiah 49, verses 20 to 21. This is what Charles Spurgeon had to say. He said, increase is needful. Increase is needful. Or what will become of the church? Increase is prayed for. And God hears prayer. Increase can only come through God. Amen. But He will give it and be glorified by it. Increase is promised in the text. Isaiah 49. And in many other scriptures, as we've seen in what we've read this morning, increase is to be labored for with agony of heart. Do we have an agony of heart? Do we have a desire in our hearts to be part of bringing in the harvest which Jesus said, it's plenty. It's plenty. Do we have that agony in our hearts to say, Lord, use me to be part of those who will bring in the multitudes? I said this is a verse of comparison. The thing with comparison is that it can be a, a really terrible thing. If, if I'm comparing our church with someone else's church, and in the process I'm like, oh, you know, in those areas we're being so much better. Pride. If, if we're comparing ourselves with, with another church and Oh man, in those areas we just think so badly. Just dejection and discouragement. I'm comparing my gift with someone else's gift. Wow, man, they, they're so gifted. Oh, it's just a terrible place to be. Joy stealer, joy killer. Probably doing that out of pride. Oh, you know what? I'm so much more gifted than them. I should be doing what they're doing. Pride. So that kind of comparison is it's, it's, it's yuck. Everyone say yuck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we need to guard our hearts as humans. We have our hearts have that tendency. That was the sin of, 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 of Satan. Comparing himself with God. And at the core of, 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 of our fallen nature is that desire to it's kind of outdo each other and outdo the next person. And that's a sin that we need to keep constantly. Say, Lord, soften my heart. I repent of this. Forgive me of this. Help me to fix my eyes on Jesus. Because 
This ministry, whatever I have, is by the mercy of God. Amen. It's by the grace of God. Amen. And as we grow in grace, as we grow stronger in grace, God helps us to stay pure in that area. Yeah. But it is still a verse of comparison. What Dr. Luke is doing here is he's comparing the church with itself. And that kind of comparison has a place. He's saying it used to be like that, now it's like this. He's reflecting on what has been happening in that same church. And there's a place for that kind of comparison, where we compare ourselves to ourselves. Because we are called to produce fruit. And unless we have some way of measuring in a godly way, how do we know whether we are producing fruit? Jesus sees a great harvest. And as we look up at that harvest, we can ask ourselves, how are we doing in reaching that harvest? It's healthy to have that kind of inward reflection helped by the Holy Spirit. As Jesus looks at our city, He sees the crowds. He sees the multitudes. So the application for us is, where is the potential for us for this kind of impact? How should we be thinking of doing church if we are to be more effective in reaching the multitudes of the city. Is this way of doing church the only way we should be doing church? And I love this way. I think this will always be part of how we do church. But are there other ways of doing church that will actually allow us to, to be more effective in reaching the multitudes? Because the multitudes are there. So that's the challenge that God has before us. So as we end the message this morning, <clears throat> may God help us to get conviction that numerical growth is actually good because it is souls coming to Christ. May God help us to step out in faith to be those who will be agents of miracles. May God use us for greater impact. May He empower us to find those crowds. And may we be part of the story of Jesus Christ in Dar es Salaam to see a city changed for the glory of His name. Amen.